All right. Well, it gives me enormous pressure, pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Schmidt from the Department of Biology at the University of Pennsylvania. I've met Mark, gosh, I think it's about 1995 when I was visiting Mark Kanishi's lab where um, Mark was studying at the time. Mark is currently Professor of Biology and co-director of the Neuroscience Undergraduate Programme at Penn. And he's always done really fascinating work on birdsong. Um, and particularly what he's going to talk about today is a framework for studying the neurobiology of female choice and courtship behavior in a social songbird. But if you're interested in finding out more about what he does, you can check it all out on his website at Penn. He does lots of work on the neural basis of song preferences and reproductive success in female songbirds. He looks at gamma simulations of sensory motor um, sequencing networks and, and looking at the interplay of the respiratory thalamic pathway and its role in motor control in songbirds. So without further ado, let's all welcome Mark and listen to his wonderful Sandwell talk. Over to you, Mark. Thank you so much, Nikki. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, well, I'll say it's an 80% pleasure to be here because um, the original plan was um, one of my favorite students, and I'll show her a picture of her, um, is, was an undergrad in my laboratory, and she has actually been accepted in the PhD program. And so she's going to actually be one of my PhD students together with another professor. And she is now doing a master's at Cambridge. And I'm highlighting her for two reasons. One is that I wanted to, um, I've always wanted to visit Cambridge. And I said, oh, maybe I'll go visit Sabina. And then I said, hey, I know Nikki. So I reached out to Nikki and I said, hey, is there a way to maybe give a presentation at your lab meeting? Um, and she said, oh, you could give a real talk. So of course, all this was planned to be in person. So we could go out for beers after this and have really fun conversations about the science and about life in general. And of course that didn't happen. Um, I also wanna highlight that, that um, Sabina, as you can see from the flag around her is, is Ukrainian. Uh, and I have to thank the community at Cambridge um, for the immense support that she certainly has felt and received over the last few weeks. Um, and um, it's obviously very hard for all of us and um, especially hard for, for Ukrainian nationals. Uh, and so my heart goes out to her and to everybody. And I just wanna thank Cambridge for being there for your students. I, um, as Nikki said, when I, when I met Nikki, uh, Nikki had just started uh, as an assistant professor at UC Davis and she, she came down to Caltech where I was with Mark Nishi and I had, was in the middle of my postdoc and I was studying and have been studying for the past 20 years as Nikki alluded to, to the neural control of singing in songbirds and when I say songbirds, what I really mean is, do you see my cursor, Nikki? Do you see my mouse? Yes, I can see your okay. cursor. Great, great. Um, so when I say songbird, it really is the zebra finch. And there are many reasons why the zebra finch is a great model system to study the neural control of vocal production. It has a very stereotyped song and it only sings one song and the song is learned. And so a lot of people, including myself, have worked out you know, part of the circuitry. Here in gray, we have the descending motor circuitry. We have these areas that are involved in uh, the plasticity of the system, uh, including vocal learning. And then we have the auditory pathway ascends and projects into this motor pathway. And there's a lot of interesting questions about uh, sensory motor integration, adaptation, and, and learning. And um, 
you know, that, that, that's been very interesting. There's always been a, a strong bias towards really focusing on the males. And I've, I've always wondered, you know, why, is, why isn't there anybody studying um, the, the other side of, the, of, of this relationship? You know, the females, she, they're perceiving, they're making decisions based on signals. And over time, um, I've come to, to sort of start thinking about this system a little bit differently. So again, why, why have people studied the zebra finch? Here is an example of a male on the left singing to a female on the right. Um, and these are three songs, um, just, cop just represent iterations of, of the same song that this bird uh, sang. The first one might have been on a Monday, the second one on a Wednesday, and the, one, the third one might have been two weeks later. And as you can see, the song is incredibly stereotyped. Um, the sequence is always the same. The acoustic features are essentially identical and the timing, the gaps between individual elements known as syllables are very, very stereotyped. So it's a perfect system to study vocal control, but maybe it's not such a good system in the sense that you're very biased in terms of thinking that this circuit is really involved in uh, only producing vocal uh, signals, uh, and also that it's highly involved in the learning component uh, of, of these types of signals. And so what I'm going to try to um, suggest today, and it's, uh, that's why my title says a framework, is to maybe look at this circuit in a slightly different way and actually try to zoom out and think of this not so much as only a circuit that controls song, but actually a circuit that controls courtship displays more generally and maybe, maybe a subtype of courtship displays, but not just song. Um, and again, the field has been very focused and, and biased, I think, in terms of thinking of this only in terms of song control. So I'm sure this is controversial. Not everybody agrees with um, you know, my perspective, but I think it's certainly an interesting one that I think is worth um, entertaining. So to give you an, an outline of, of, of today's presentation, what I want to do is tell you a little bit more about courtship. What do I mean by courtship? Different people define courtship uh, in different ways. And um, I also want to give you a rationale for the pivot that my lab has done. And that is moving away from zebra finches, which are really the workhorse of the field, to um, the North American brown-headed cowbird. And as you'll see, I think there are many reasons why this, I think, is a very good system to study these types of questions. The second part of the talk is really kind of going to be the meat of the talk, and that's I'm going to look at uh, using the cowbird, looking at female responsiveness to song. Um, and, and here, as, as shown in the picture on the right, um, females will, will um, uh, produce these very stereotyped um, responses. These are known as copulation solicitation displays in response to the presentation of song. And these uh, responses happen in natural environments with lots of other conspecific birds, but they also can, can occur in, uh, in small boxes. And so we have a, a real nicely tractable system to actually try to understand the neural control of this behavior, which I will argue can be conceptualized as part of courtship behaviors. Because um, as I'll say, my, my definitions of courtship will be a little bit more broad than how a lot of people might think about them. And then in the last five minutes, I just want to give an idea of the direction we're going uh, to study courtship um, um, behavior, which is a complex behavior, is you can't really just do that in um, a small box. And you want to do this in a more naturalistic environment. So we've created this, what we call the smart aviary, which is equipped with 10 computer vision cameras and an array of 24 microphones, where we are trying to um, uh, monitor moment to moment behavioral interactions between large groups of birds. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we wanna do with this. So courtship behavior um, is ubiquitous amongst um, animals and it's observed in invertebrates and observed in vertebrate animals. And it's strongly under um, sexual selection, uh, uh, um, driven or modified by, by sexual selection. So basically, um, in many ways, uh, these are, are six different examples. One of the common thread, and again, this is, you know, some people might argue with me, but ultimately, 
these displays, these, these courtship displays have a strong motor component and these motor components display in one way or another something about neuromuscular abilities of the male. And so in essence, they, they form a sign of fitness that females can evaluate. And because it's so critical for reproductive success is that these um, types of behaviors are really driven by female preference, female choice. And so for the top left, for example, you have an al American alligator uh, and it has these laryngeal bellows that it can vibrate really quickly to produce this water dance. And so you can look at the water dance and say, wow, this is very interesting and cool. But really, ultimately, what it is, is the alligator is trying to display the ability to create these water dances by very rapid neuromuscular control that is not just fast and precise, but can, can act over a long period of time. So you're both, um, you're, you're looking at acuity of motor control, but also endurance. And you can make these same arguments for song, probably for nest building in these puffer fish. So fine motor control over long periods of time. So how do we define courtship? Um, again, the way I'm going to define it um, is a type of behavior that is going to increase uh, mating success. And I'm specifically dividing here mating success from the act of copulation. Um, in sort of the older literature, we can think of this part, the courtship is the more appetitive type of behavior that leads up to uh, the actual act um, of copulation. And the traditional way of thinking about this is that courtship displays are typically produced by males and they're selected for uh, by females. And in most um, species, this is gonna be true but there's a strong bias towards assuming that the signals or the courtship interactions are really only driven by the males displaying to the females and females making the choices. In fact, there are probably lots of good examples where females are actually sending signals back to the males and it really is an interactive type of communication system that ultimately is, its purpose is to increase fitness, which means increase the number of offspring surviving to, to the next generation. So I'm gonna use this um, definition here by Fuzani, uh, which des describes courtship as the behavior used to obtain copulations with a partner or to maintain reproductive interactions with an existing partner. And so this kind of broadens the definition. And when you say maintains reproductive interactions with an existing partner, you can see that there there's gonna be signals by both members of this partnership um, that ultimately will lead to copulation, which is the act of uh, insemination by, of the male with, with, with the female. So turns out that I could probably do a lot, ask a bunch of these questions with zebra finches, but they're not ideal in many ways, just because the courtship interactions and displays are not as rich as other species and some of the aspects of the interactions, certainly on the female side, are really hard to quantify and certainly visualize. And so what I did um, a few years ago is I pivoted towards uh, the American um, brown-headed cowbird. And this is in large part because of my friend and colleague David White. So David um, was a professor at University of Pennsylvania and we kept thinking about how can we interact more closely? Um, and ironically, it's pretty much after he left Penn to go back to Canada where he's from that most of our collaborations happened. And so we've done a lot of papers over the last you know, 10 years or so together. And he was at Penn and he was working with brown-headed cowbirds and from a purely practical standpoint, I'm a neurobiologist by training, and I do like to try to think about, you know, recording from brain areas. Um, and cowbirds are much larger than zebra finches. They're about, you know, three to four times larger in size. So, you know, on a practical side, you can put more headgear on their heads if you want to try to record uh, neural activity in in naturalistic environments uh, when during courtship interactions. But really that's, that's a very practical reason. There are strong biological reasons why cowbirds are very interesting. As you might or might not, might not know, 
is that um, cowbirds are obligate brood parasites, meaning that they're obliged to um, lay their eggs in host uh, species nests and have the host actually raise their offspring. That's the only way that they can reproduce. Um, and so here, for example, is a nest of an American robin, different from the European robin that's on Shala's picture. Um, and here, what you have is a small egg um, and that's laid by the cowbird. Interestingly enough, so the behaviors are very similar to what you might be more familiar with. There's a lot of work that's been done at Cambridge um, by Nick Davies on cuckoos and brood parasitism in cuckoos. So ultimately, the, the cowbird is going to hatch. Um, it does not have the types of um, aggressive defensive behaviors that cuckoos have. It often will outcompete the resident um, uh, uh, nestlings. And the mom and dad, uh, Robin in this case, will raise um, this, this uh, cowbird. And it is only found in North America. Some of them are migratory, but a lot of them right here is Pennsylvania. They're, um, they're here year long, so we can, we can trap them and, and then we can study them. But that in itself, being a brood parasite is not a good reason for using this as a model system for studying courtship behavior. The main reason why these are very interesting species is that they're incredibly gregarious socially. So they have these complex social rules that ultimately lead to mating success and eventual reproductive behavior. And why should that be the case? Well, if you think about it, it actually does make sense. So here you're raised by a different species and there could be many species. It could be a robin, it could be a red-winged blackbird, it could be a warbler. And these have um, features, behavioral uh, traits that have nothing to do with your own species behavior. So what you do is once you fledge, you leave the nest and then you aggregate in these huge flocks. And so the, a lot of what's interesting about these birds is a lot of learning, including song learning. First of all, song is probably much more innate, but there are aspects of song that are going to actually develop later in life when they get in these big social groups. And there are lots of interesting social interactions between males, uh, between males and females, and probably between females as well. Interestingly, um, if you look at mating success, it is you're trying to find a mate to optimize the reproductive success. And many bird species, including cowbirds, actually show strong pair bonding behavior. If you're not so familiar with pair bonding, you can think of this as marriage. And sometimes people will even, when pair bonds break from one season to the next, they actually call it divorce. So you can think of it in a very similar way. An open question is why would a brood parasite species actually form a pair bond? And that's an open question, but these females will navigate you know, large areas in the forest and um, scout out different nests where they want to eventually lay their eggs. And so maybe they need to be pair bonded so there's always a male near them so they can um, you know, be fertilized before they actually lay their eggs. So basically, having the male close by to provide necessary sperm when sort of on demand. So again, th there's open questions as to why, why, why that's actually necessary. Um, if we look at the types of interactions between cowbirds, as I mentioned, um, they're very social and they have lots of different social signals. So here, for example, we have a male cowbird that's why it's called the brown-headed cowbird because it has a brown top, so it's sexually, sexually dimorphic and black feathers in the main body. And the females are a little bit smaller and mostly brownish, grayish plumage. And males produce a song that sounds something like this. So here is our two introductory note clusters, one, two, and then a terminal whistle, and it sounds like this. Females also produce a vocalization but interestingly, and this is really interesting for the point I'm trying to make when I talk about the neurobiology, is that they don't actually produce a song. They produce calls. And these are known as chatter calls or rattle calls because their whole body kind of rattles when they produce it. And it has these chevron-like shape. Um, um, and so the, the audio is not very good on this, but it sounds something like this. It's like, duh, 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 duh. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, what, what its function might be. If we look at the song of the male, and we think about courtship and why should a male produce courtship signals and why might it be selected for by the females, 
Again, I said courtship displays are really a way to show neuromuscular control. And here's the male song again, so the introductory notes followed by the whistle. And if you look at these introductory notes right here, this cluster, and you actually measure um, airflow in the syrinx, which is the vocal organ, which sits down here. So you have the trachea and then the vocal organ and then the lungs, is that um, this is work by Rod Southers, where you can actually show that in this introductory note cluster is that the first part of the cluster is only produced by the left side of the syrinx. And then the next note is by the right side and then the left and then the right and then the left. So you're switching back and forth between both sides at an incredibly rapid rate. And this is incredible, requires really precise neuromuscular control um, in this vocal organ. And most likely these are the types of features, acoustic features within the song that the females paying very close attention to. And similar to the zebra finch, um, we can look at, these are actually songs collected from our aviary. We can uh, record from a number of different songs. We can cluster them using things like UMAP. Um, and, and if you take songs from this different cluster, you can see that the songs are incredibly similar. So they're highly stereotyped um, as adults and different birds will produce different types of song. In terms of their overall behavior, they show um, aspects that we don't see in the zebra finch. So for one is that you have lots of different song interactions between males and there's a lot of display involved. So males, when they sing to other males produce these very long large wing displays. Uh, and that together with uh, the song itself actually carries lots of information about probably dominance, um, rank within the group. Um, there are also lots of other types of interesting behaviors. There's a so-called head down display right here where birds will actually come together and actually hold these displays for sometimes up to a minute or two, which is very bizarre. Um, every undergrad who comes to a cowbird lab, there are not many cowbird labs, once they see this, they're hooked and they just want to study this for the rest of, of their, their careers. But these are hard to, um, to we, we don't know what actually causes these. And there are other types of displays known as a head up display when Burke kind of like does that. And those are very aggressive interactions. So there's a richness of the types of displays that they use. And while not directly linked to courtship, this is part of sort of this overall kind of social complexity in these birds. And then the last, Point I want to make here is one that is just a still fit picture from a 1970s video clip from Meredith West and Andrew King, really pioneers uh, in, in this field where females, this is a female, this is a male singing to her, will produce these very rapid wing strokes. So it's typically unilateral from one side. So you produce, you move the wing and it only gets moved for about 200 milliseconds and occurs very rapidly after song onset. This seems to be an important signal, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So suggesting that the courtship interactions are not just a one-way street between males singing to the females, but actually females are actually responding to the males and providing really important cues to let the male know whether or not um, he's doing the right thing or whether she likes it or not. And then the last reason, and perhaps the main reason why I got attracted to uh, cowbirds was this behavior. Um, this is in an aviary, which I'll show you in a second, where the female has just been sung to several times by a male, and she arches her back in what is known as a copulation solicitation display. And notice that this is known, it's called a copulation solicitation display, not just a copulation display. So solicitation suggests that it is more than just the act of copulation, it's actually soliciting the copulation. And in some animals, it's sort of like one and done. Uh, you know, they do the CSD and then you get copulation. There are some species that will actually produce these types of behaviors for hours before the male actually does copulate. So it, it appears to have some signaling function uh, in, in these females um, and probably most likely in, in the cowbird. What's really nice about this is that it's a way to ask the female, what does she like about the male song? So here in this example um, is a bird in a box. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play it to you and you'll see that, that she's just perching. She doesn't know this is anything is gonna happen. And then as soon as I play the song, the male song, she'll go, I produce this posture. And sometimes these birds will hold this posture for, um, 
up to a minute, sometimes even longer. And so these are very robust. And as I'll show you in a second, um, we can use this behavior to actually rank female preference to some. Before I get into the neurobiology um, and using this uh, so-called CSD assay to look at female preference and kind of get into the neurobiology of um, courtship display, um, what I want to do is, is just talk about a, a recent study that we're, we're currently under review um, in, um, in, 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 in a journal from my grad student. And I just want to highlight, first of all, it's interesting, but also want to highlight um, that courtship could be more than just what individuals do or maybe dyadic uh, individuals with so interaction between two different birds, but it could actually be thought of as maybe coordinated in some fashion across the entire group. So here is the type of aviary where a lot of this work is done. This is um, up in Canada with my friend David. I'm just going to show you the the, the types of the complexity of these types of behaviors. This is late in the breeding season. Um, we have here um, a bird, a male courting a female. And what you'll see is that the male will sing to her multiple times. Um, and then eventually um, she tries to chase him away every time. And then eventually she just somehow something of what the male did got to her and then she goes into posture and then he will copulate her. A lot of the courtship, probably happened weeks before this, because if the female did not like this male, she would never allow him to get this close. So typically if a male reach, uh, um, approaches a female and she doesn't is, has no interest, she'll just fly away and never allow him to approach her. So again, here I'm gonna show you a little video clip showing the types of behaviors that we can observe in, in our aviaries. And again, this is work done um, in David White's lab. So here's the female, and the male is trying to court her. March, cloudy, 20. He's singing right now. He's going to sing again. It's behind. And she's clearly not that interested. He tries to sing again. M -O -B -D -N, new line. And finally, arches her back new, and talks late. Happens very fast. No other thing to cloaca to the female the so cloaca kiss bone transfer. Um, so this is kind of a dyadic interaction. And what I want to kind of tell you, and this is why I'm, I get interested by sort of studying cowbirds, is that the complexity of these behaviors. Um, and one thing that if you look at these areas, what you notice is that males will sing to each other. And these, the songs that males will sing to each other, you can think of them as more antagonistic songs, kind of like aggressive song interactions. And then what they'll do is that they will also sing to the females, and you can think of these as courtship songs. And we don't understand very well the difference in sort of acoustic features, differences between male-directed uh, and female-directed song, but clearly they have very different functions. Although when males sing to each other, females are clearly paying attention to what they're doing, and a lot of the hierarchies and ranks are kind of established during these male-male interactions. You can think of them almost, almost as proxies for, for, for fights. And what my student noticed is that this seemed to happen a lot. We have these patterns where males will sing to each other and then sing to the female and then soon sing to each other that did not seem completely random. And then so he asked me, this was kind of late in his PhD, surprisingly late in this issue, I think six months before he defended, he said, I want to analyze this. And then we reached out to David and then David said, yes, I've observed this as well. So what he tried to do is actually quantify this behavior um, in a number of different ways. So here in this plot in gray, what we're showing is the ratio of female directed song. So one would be all the songs produced. So in this case, it would be that most of the songs are male directed. So you have uh, 90 percent, the white here is male directed and gray is female directed. And so this is one time bin. And then what, what Ammon, my student, noticed is that oftentimes a bin where you had mostly male directed song would be preceded by a female directed song. And then it would also follow. So you kind of went through these phases of sort of singing more towards males and then more towards females and more towards males and more towards females. And you can rep represent the study differently as a, as a network. Where here you see most of the males are singing to each other. And then three minutes later, they're mostly singing to the females. 
So what he wanted to do is quantify this. And the way he quantified this is he took each male in the aviary. And again, interestingly, these were data that David had collected over 20 years uh, in 19 different aviaries. And so, he can, and so these are focal samples. So David goes in the aviary and he talks into a microphone and records everything. And he knows if the male singing to a male or to the female, and he, he just knows the ID of the different males. And so we have this huge data set that Ammon analyzed. And, and each triangle here is basically the cohesion of individual males. What you do is you basically take um, over time, and this is over, over a day, but a, over many days, is you, you create a time series and you say, how many female directed songs does he produce? And, and you do this ratio. And so if it's not a female directed song, then it's male directed song. So you have this time series and you do pairwise correlation between each male in, in the aviary. So male A to male B, male A to male C, male A to male D, male B to male C, and so on and so forth. And so you get a, a cohesion level um, of each male and the black dot is the average for the entire aviary. So each aviary will have between five, four, five, and, and eight males at most. And what we noticed is that different aviaries have different, different levels of cohesion. And so the way you can think of cohesion is that zero cohesion is that every individual in the aviary kind of does his own thing. And what I mean by thing, thing here is song. So it's randomized um, in terms of what type of song they sing relative to other males. If you have a high level of cohesion, that means that males tend to sing male-directed song when other males sing male-directed song, and they tend to sing female-directed song when other uh, males sing female-directed song. And what you notice is that different aviaries have different levels of cohesion. Some have really low cohesion, and some have very high cohesion. And not shown here, you can actually introduce juvenile males into these aviaries, and they absolutely so it's almost as if the cohesion that there are social rules within the aviary, and so birds will abide by that. And juveniles, just like any you know, 14-year-old teenage boy, you throw them in and they think they know everything and they don't abide by the rules and they sort of create some sort of chaos in the system. And so not shown here, but if you introduce juvenile males in these aviaries, the level of cohesion decreases by a lot. So that's interesting. So you have these behaviors that seem to occur at the group level. And what we can do in these aviaries is, as I told you, um, cowbirds are brood parasites. So they will lay eggs in nests under natural conditions. So I showed you the nest of American robin. What you can also do in these aviaries is you can put nests on the side and you can put these little wooden eggs inside of them. And it's incredible when you go into the aviary and you look during the breeding season, the females are so interested in these nests. And when it comes time, they will go into these nests, they'll sneak in and they'll lay an egg. And so what you can do is you can count the amount of eggs that are laid by these birds. In some cases, you can even try to incubate these eggs and, and measure all sorts of features about, you know, what, what is the fertility rate of these eggs and you can even hatch them and measure something about sort of features about from, from the offspring. So one of the question was, is there something special about this type of, I'll call it sort of group courtship uh, cohesion um, and does it play a role possibly in increasing reproductive success as measured by the number of eggs that are laid? And it turns out, and we were surprised that we tried to do this blind and we were hoping, um, and then when we saw the data, we noticed that there was a very nice relationship that the less cohesive the aviary as a group, um, the lower the reproductive score in terms of number of eggs that are counted and the higher the cohesion, the higher the overall reproductive score. So again, this is something we're still working on. We're in revision um, at the journal, but I think it's a very interesting group level effect that clearly has some neural basis to it. And this is something, and I'll try to get back to it at the end of my talk, that we're very interested in looking at these sort of group level dynamics and how it might possibly affect individual uh, fitness in, in, in these groups. 
So I'm going to pivot now, um, and I'm going to move towards the, the, the core of my talk, which is really thinking about using female display um, and female preference for song as a way to try to get at the neural control of courtship behavior. And it kind of, this work kind of made me start to think about the song system in a very different way. So here's a box. Um, these little um, squares here are so-called QR codes. And it's just a way to synchronize the cameras we have. So there's a camera here. There's a camera, obviously, that's taking a shot right here. And then there's a camera to the left. So we can create a 3D uh, representation of the cowbird. And I've already shown you this, but I'll show it to you again uh, because it's quite dramatic. I'm presenting a song. The sound doesn't work but you'll see the response that this female does to the song. So here, so she's on her perch. She's just, she has no idea this anything is coming. And then all of a sudden you present the song and boom, she goes into, into posture. And in this case, she holds it for really quite a long time. So what you do is you present these songs every 90 minutes um, over two weeks and you present 10 different songs in randomized order and you have to wait 90 minutes between trials, otherwise birds will habituate to the signal and actually not respond. And what you can do then is you can calculate the proportion of times that the female will actually go into posture, produce these copulation solicitation displays when you present the song. And you can see here for song number one, she went into posture 85% of the time, which is very a very high, very robust phenomenon. But what's interesting with the cowbirds is that you can actually present a whole array of songs and you can show that some songs have high potency and some songs have very low potency. So song number 10, for example, the bird never went into posture. One thing that I should emphasize is that, and this is David White, my collaborator in Canada is, is very strict about this, is we only do, do this during the breeding season and we do not add any exogenous estrogen like a lot of other people have done in cowbirds or in other species like canaries or, or um, sparrows. And the reason for this is we want the birds to have their natural levels of estrogen. And if you pump them up with too much estrogen, there are stories where you just slam the door and they go into posture. So for us to get this ranking, we really are relying on, on sort of intrinsic levels of, of estrogen. So this, this is a really nice assay because we can, what we can say is that this is a very potent song and this is an, a much less potent song as told to us by the female. And these error bars are across females. So all females agree that song number one is a potent song and the song number 10 is just not very interesting. And so Ammon and I decided we wanted to look more carefully at these behaviors. Oftentimes, you know, there's a term in the field sort of fixed action pattern and we kind of assume that a lot of these innate survival behaviors are just fixed. And there's a whole literature coming out now that a lot of you know, attack behaviors, defensive behaviors are actually um, have an overall pattern, but it is modulatable. And you know, there's some really nice work out there, even on vocalizations in uh, mice, for example, where you know, stimulation of certain hypothalamic areas like the POA can actually modulate duration and strength of these what we call, what we used to think of sort of fixed uh, behaviors. And so what we can do is we can look at how these females respond to song and we can look at the low potency songs. So again, they don't respond very often, but they do respond every now and then. And we can ask when they respond, how long do they respond? And when they respond here to the high potency songs, how long does it last? And you can look, there's a correlation between the duration that you hold the display and the potency of the song. You can also look at the latency and you can ask, do females respond more quickly to a high potency, high, like a song of high potency versus a song of low potency? Again, low potency, you don't have many of them, but when they respond, they tend to take much longer to respond. And so you can show this inverse relationship that with latency. So the higher the song potency, they respond right away. And with lower, lower potency, they're kind of deciding and they're not sure. And then by the time they decide, then you know half a second or a second has passed. So it's an interesting relationship between potency and both duration um, and, and latency. 
So that's the behavior and we've quantified that pretty carefully. And so now the question is, what controls this? And there's a suggestion here that because of the variation of the behavior, maybe there's some sort of higher order control that can modulate, maybe based on something about the internal state of the animal or something about how the animal translates the signal and the potency of the signal to translate into a motor act. And it seems like a completely far-fetched idea that this circuit that I showed you in my second slide, that is the so-called song system, uh, might actually be involved in uh, controlling this behavior. But it turns out there was some early work by Elliot Brenowitz in the 90s that suggested that in fact, if you lesion this area HVC right here, um, that it can actually lose the selectivity um, in canaries. And again, these were birds that were like pumped up with estrogen, so it's a little hard to, to evaluate. And canaries are also kind of a funny model because canaries, um, both males and females sing. And so they have this song system, both the male and the female. Because again, everybody assumes that this circuit is involved in the control of singing. And this is um, kind of where this assumption comes from. This is from an early paper by Nadebaum and Arnold in the mid seventies, where they looked at a number of structures in the brain of males and females that are not related to the song system here, and these areas that are related to the song system. And this here is um, nissel stain of RA, this structure right here, this is the output of the song system going down to the brainstem structures. And you can see it's very large in the male and much smaller in the female. This was really used to kind of define uh, this uh, sexual dimorphism between males and females. And essentially it was used to argue that males have a song system and females don't. And, and that goes even further. You can look at, for example, our area X here, um, which is shown in the previous slide over here, really important for song learning. And there it seems like males have complete area X, but it's not at all visible in the female. And so again, that was a strong argument that females don't have the song system, but it turns out that nissel stain is kind of a funny stain. Nissel stain stains for highly densely populated areas of the brain. So the more dense you are, the stronger the signal. And if it's not so dense, then you don't see it so well. So do females actually have a song system? And th that's not really known. It wasn't known five, six years ago. Now there's some evidence coming out that it does exist, but we wanted to know about the female cowbird, because as I told you, female cowbirds do not sing a song. They will produce some calls, but they don't sing a song. And if the circuit is, which is known as the song system is necessary and sufficient for song, then why should females have it? So the first thing we did when the process of doing is comparing these different areas in male and female cowbirds. So males are on the left and females on the right. And you can see that males have a very big HVC, this structure, and females have it, but it's much smaller, harder to see. Females have a very large RA and they have a small RA, harder to see. Area X is, we cannot see it in the female. So it almost seems like area X is not there. So what does that mean? Where does that leave us? Does the female have a circuit or not? So the way to actually do the right experiment is you, you inject. So we cannot see it under Nissel, but we assume that it's there. So we're gonna inject the same coordinates as where the male area X is. And then we inject it with a virus that's retrogradely labels the neurons in HVC that project to area X. And here, what you see is that you have very beautiful label. So area X, even though you cannot see it with Nissel, does in fact exist in the female cowbird brain. And Nikki, this is for you. Female cowbirds have huge hippocampi. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to highlight, and I showed that to Dmitry Aronoff also, and he was just blown away. He said, wow, this is almost just as big as the, as the titmice. <laughs> so, um, and again, why do female cowbirds have huge hippocampi? Probably because they have really good spatial memory to know where to go and find the nests to eventually lay their eggs. So uh, that's kind of an interesting thing. And I would love to talk to you more about this because I, I have ideas to work with uh, Dmitry Aronoff to try to record from hippocampus in our aviary um, uh, at some point. So in fact, what we've done is we've also injected RA 
If RA is part of the song system, it should back label HVC and LMAN, and it should project down to these brainstem areas just as in the male. And in fact, this is what we see. So our conclusion is that females, um, cowbirds, even though they don't sing, they have the complete song system, even though it might be smaller uh, and not as, 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 as developed as the male, but it, they definitely have a song system, even though they don't sing. So what does a song system do? So I showed you this um, experiment we did. So we present um, the 10 different songs and the female tells us what uh, she likes best, right? She likes one, she doesn't like 10. So if I lesion HVC, so we did these experiments, uh, this is the McGuire paper a while back, and we asked what, how does the female respond to song number one? Turns out she responds just as well as the intact female. So HVC is not necessary for the production of this behavior. But I'll let you think for just 10 seconds, what do you think happens when we look at songs two through 10? Okay, what do you think, what you might expect? So this is what we see. What we see is that there seems to be a complete loss in the selectivity of these females. So now it's as if they listen to the song and they cannot decide whether it's potent or not and they will always go in, into posture. So we were very excited by that. And, and this finding kind of single-handedly caused me to kind of pivot because I said, this is really interesting. And it, I, think, I think there's something profound here. And even though we're studying the female, I think ultimately we can maybe understand something about the male. And actually Ammon, my student, <laughs> was attracted by this as well. And that's what made him sort of join my lab. So it's worth just for you know, a few seconds thinking about why did people think that the song system was linked to singing and, and song learning. So if you look at the original paper in 1976 by Fernando Nottebaum, he's, he's the one that defined the song system. How did he define the song system? Well, he defined it by a neural circuit that innervates the muscles that control vocalization. So he literally cut the nerve that innervates these muscles and asked what area of the brain degenerates. That was kind of how, you know, circuit tracing was done in the 70s. Once he found this area, the um, hypoglossonucleus, then he lesioned it and looked to see what parts of the brain degenerate. And through this process, he mapped out N12 and then this area RA and then area HVC that I talked about and then areas that HVC projected to. So it's a very biased way. It's a circuit that controls vocal output because it was defined as a circuit based on, on what we were looking for. But that doesn't mean that that is all that the circuit does. Yes, it controls vocalization, but maybe it also controls other parts of uh, other types of behavior. So what could the song system be used for in the female? Well, it turns out the whole call thing, you know, those of you not so familiar, we kind of always assume calls are kind of uninteresting, unimportant, but it turns out that calls are probably very important for courtship interactions and the timing of calls are important. So um, here's a paper by Benichoff who, who's now um, in Germany doing a postdoc, but this is the time when he was with Arthur Chernikovsky. They did these assays where females or males would do these in vocal interactions and you get these antiphonal calls. You present a call in the speaker and then the female or the male like responds right away. And what you notice is that if you lesion part of the song system, this area RA, is that the timing that was very precise in a normal control bird becomes much less precise. So maybe the song system is involved in timing control and it's probably involved at some level. And even in the cowbird, it seems probably plays a very important role. So I showed you this before, this is the female chatter um, and this is the male song. And what we did uh, up with David, this is one of my grad students, Luke, is we looked at the precise timing of when females produced a chatter call when the male sang. Because the, the previous hypothesis was that chatter call was a way to attract males to sing to them. Um, if that's true, then what you'd expect is that the chatter call should precede the male song to attract. In, in fact, what we notice is that the chatter call always happens after the song, after song onset. 
and almost immediately after with very precise timing. And the hypothesis we have is that um, a lot of animals have sexual conflict and it's an arms race where the male wants to produce the a signal as potent as possible to get the female to do what he wants. And the female is trying to protect herself to not kind of succumb to these strong signals and maybe spend more time trying to evaluate um, the male signal before making a decision as to whether she should mate with, with uh, a, a given male. And so again, these chatter calls happen with very, very short latency after males produce the song. And then we wanted to, to do this in the laboratory and ask whether these chatter calls could actually inhibit uh, the copulatory display in females. And this is kind of a fun image where we can actually get these um, females to respond to song in a nine cage rack. And seven out of the nine will go into posture, but focus on these boxes, these three boxes when I play the song, you can see all three of these females going to posture. They're all, all going into song. So we can play song and we can monitor this behavior. And what we can do is we can play the song at the same time uh, presenting a signal that's mimicking this chatter response. Females don't really do a chatter response in, in the laboratory. And the hypothesis is that what this chatter is doing is actually jamming the male signal, basically taking out the, the parts of the song that are really hard for the male to produce that presumably um, the females are paying close attention to and probably elicit this copulatory display. Um, so we did that, and then we also did controls where we just played white noise, and then we played band passed um, at the same loudness, the same signal, but we allowed the bottom part to kind of bleed through. And, and the hypothesis was that this signal should be less potent at blocking the response than the natural signal. And so that's in fact what we see. This was a COVID experiment. This Our lab was shut down during the first season of COVID, and so we opened up and it was pretty late in the season. So that's why these responses are on the low side rather than like at a 0.8. This was kind of late in the breeding season. So estrogen was low, but when you present song under these conditions, you get a response. When you present the chatter, you completely block the response. If you present white noise, completely block the response. But if you take this here, you actually get um, a, a significant difference between uh, chatter and white noise and this band pass chatter. So the idea here is that, yes, maybe the song system is involved in somehow evaluating or producing the timing of these calls in response to song in a way to sort of jam the signal and evaluate um, male. And so when I say evaluate, um, you don't want to go into response right away when the male sings to you, but you actually want to probably have him sing a bunch of times. Um, without eliciting that response. So you jam the signal and then you watch him, you watch the display, you watch how big he is, how, how, how rigorous um, his types of, of, of behaviors are. So um, what, what we wanted to do is, is, is how do we think about the song system? So it's not really consistent with, with how most people think about it. We think about the song system as controlling these different areas that are involved in breathing, that are involved in the vocal musculature. Um, and that's how we think, but I'm gonna do like a sleight of hand and kind of, I'm, I'm not gonna add anything that doesn't exist, but I'm gonna emphasize some parts more than others. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just lump these areas, these rep respiratory areas, I'm gonna ignore the vocal musculature right now. And I'm just gonna create this brainstem module that gets innervated by RA just as RAM. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you that this connection exists. This is a hypothalamic area that actually receives strong auditory input and it projects to these areas. This is known as the PAG in mammals. It also projects to RAM. And this is what's interesting is everybody in the field always assumes that RAM only controls breathing behavior consistent with vocalization. And Martin Wild, who I think Nikki probably also knows, um, showed recently that actually RAM projects all the way down to the sacrospinal cord to the muscles of the cloaca. And so how is the cloaca involved in singing behavior? And in the question Q&A, we can talk about that maybe it is, but, but it's, 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 it seems surprising that a vocal control system should actually innervate the cloaca. And um, we can, I, I don't have time to show you this, but when birds go into posture, they actually do contract their cloaca um, at, a, at a rate of about four or five um, kind of contractions per, per second or so. It's pretty fast, 
and, and for all you could imagine that it's part of a signal. So if you look at how I redrew the circuit, this is almost exactly identical, perhaps homologous to the circuit that in, in the rodent literature, we, we call the lordosis circuit. This is a circuit that is involved in arching of the back in female rats when males mount them. Uh, and there, we don't know, the signals that actually cause lordosis is probably some more to do with somatosensory um, activation and, 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 and odors. Um, and here is just a, a, an analogous for now, I'll say a circuit, but it's driven by auditory, auditory inputs. So this is a very different way of thinking about the song system and may, makes me think that maybe it's a multifunctional circuit that regulates both vocal and non-vocal types of displays. And, and so is a copulation solicitation display, is it courtship or not? I mean, I'm sure people would argue, but you can argue that, that you know, it's called solicitation. You're soliciting the male to copulate. So technically it could be lumped within courtship, courtship behavior. So the model on how to kind of think about this uh, is in the following way. So um, you can think of, of RA has a very strong input onto, onto RAM uh, and that most of CSD is driven by an auditory input that kind of drives RAM, but the inhibitory signal from the song system outweighs the excitatory signal directly caused by the auditory input. And so under normal conditions, you do not get a, um, a CSD uh, for, for normal song. But if the song is very potent, then you're uh, conceptually, you're removing this inhibition and then you're allowing this to actually cause the response. And if the song is of poor quality or if you're actually lesioning uh, the HVC, um, then what happens, um, sorry, if, if you lesion HVC, then what you're doing essentially is you're removing the, the inhibitory effect of RA onto RAM. And so now a signal, even a weak signal can actually drive this input because this is the only driver of RAM to produce this copulatory output. So I'm gonna skip this because I don't have time, but I think conceptually this can um, relate to how we should think about male song, especially in songs like the cowbird where you have a strong uh, a postural display that zebra finches do not have. And so this is a question that no one has really looked at. This is the, the, the last part of the talk I wanna just focus on because I'm, I didn't realize I'm running, I'm running late here, but this, this is I think the most interesting finding that, that we've had. So I told you that females, um, when their HVCs are lesioned, they lose selectivity for songs. So they go into, into, into um, and posture for all of the 10 songs. What David and I did is we were wanting to know like what happens to general interactions in the aviary when we lesion HVC. So that had never been looked at. So what we can do is we can do these network plots and females are all in squares, males are the circles and based on focal sampling, you can see that all the males are singing to each other and females only receive song from typically one male. Sometimes a female might receive song from a few males, but most of the females receive song from one male. This is how we actually define pair bonding in these large aviaries. So if a female receives 70% or more of her songs from one male, uh, that is defined as a pair bond. And what, what we did is we took um, females out to the lab, kept them for a week, did a sham operation and then brought them back. And so now when I present this, surprisingly, this is amazing. Like they're gone from the whole social group for about a week and you bring half the females back and everything goes back to where it was before. So the females st still get only sung to by their consort male, their peer bonded male. These patterns are incredibly robust. So what happens when you actually take a female out, you lesion HVC and you put her back in the aviary. The expert observer looks at these females and they look exactly like all the other females. And it's not like they go into posture all the time. Going into posture in an aviary is very costly. Um, and so you don't wanna do that. And you're probably evaluating lots of different signals. And so they don't go into posture. 
But this is what we observed, which is, I think, fascinating, is that when we introduced the females into the aviary that had HVC lesions, all the males in the group started singing to those females. So we're changing something in the brain of the female that is ultimately then changing the behavior of the males in the group. And so that in itself made me so interested in suggesting this sort of bi-directional communication with courtship um, and, and really kind of also kind of forced me, made me pivot in, in this direction. So how do we study this? Like, what is it about the females that, 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 that is causing these males to sink to them? We don't know what it is, but we decided we wanted to analyze this more carefully. So we built this large aviary, which reminds me of the beautiful aviaries that Nikki showed me at UC Davis with Sarah Botcher a few years back. Um, uh, <laughs> I didn't appreciate it at the time, Nikki, but now that I know how hard it is to build these things, I totally appreciate it. Um, and so we have this smart aviary that we're working with um, engineers and physicists to kind of look at. at. Um, but this is a behavior that, that we see and that's been described in the 70s. Uh, and this is a so-called wing stroke. Um, let me show that here's a male singing to this female and I'm gonna show it in, in real time and then slow down. And she's gonna produce this very rapid unilateral movement of her wing. You might not have seen it, but you, it's slowed down now. And so you should see this little yellow arrow will show you when it happens. Interesting, you see her crouch down a little bit, almost as if she's going to go into posture, but then she produces this very rapid wing stroke. These are very hard to see um, and, and they're interesting. And so one of the hypotheses we have is that when the male sings to the female, she produces a wing stroke. Maybe this is intended to be a very private signal between the male and the female. When you lesion HVC, what you're doing is you're removing the selectivity for that postural response with a wing stroke. And the idea is that the females that are reintroduced with HVC lesions are maybe no longer able to regulate their wing strokes. So when other males sing, they essentially have lost their selectivity for producing wing strokes and then they produce the wing stroke when other males sing. And then they say, oh, she's interested in my song, so I'll keep singing. And at a group level, all the males start doing this. And it turns out that that this dynamic of male singing to the females happens almost immediately upon reintroduction of these females uh, into the aviary. So this is kind of the essence of what I wanted to share with you today. I also wanted to show you like in the last two minutes, if I may, where we're going. Um, for one is that these wing strokes are gonna be, I think a, a really rich um, uh, direction for us because Oftentimes it's not just that focal female early in the season that produce wing strokes, but there are multiple females that produce the wing strokes. And sometimes the females that don't produce the wing strokes, oops, I didn't show that, that don't produce the wing strokes actually will shift their gaze to look at the females that actually do produce the wing strokes. So I think that we're really underappreciating the power of females in these social groups in driving male behavior. Um, and so we want to quantify all of this. And so we have this aviary and we're working with computer vision folks who are figuring out how to identify birds, how to track them. We have this cool mesh model that we can fit birds with to look at their shape. And we're trying basically uh, to, to look at pose on a moment to moment basis throughout the entire breeding season. It's lots and lots of terabytes of data. And we're also, a recording song from arrays of microphone where we can localize song in different parts of the aviary with the goal of producing these um, ethograms for each individual bird within the social group. Um, and ultimately, this is to be able to quantify courtship. And um, what I, my dream is to kind of come back and do what I did early days with Marconishi, but rather than doing it in a single bird, uh, doing it within a bird acting in a naturalistic context. And I think one of the more interesting variables, I think Nikki would agree with this with social birds like Corvids is social context. To what extent does social context 
actually play a role as a variable in how animals process information. We have these signals, song, uh, that are very potent signals, and we can ask how does the brain process this information and how is it modified by the context in which they actually hear these songs. So I'm going over a little bit, so I want to stop here and thank you for um, making it all the way to the end, most of you, and just thank my lab, kind of the Cowbird group, and also the computer vision lab over in engineering, and then eventually the physics lab, who's going to try to take a lot of this data and uh, put it together. So apologies for going a little bit over, but uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, for a wonderful talk. Um, so rich in its context, and it's wonderful to see so much behavior or social context of behavioral details um, creeping into the research on song. Um, I was fascinated in particular, although I started obviously with zebra finches like you, I was particularly fascinated by the cowbird work. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood properly what happens to the female cowbirds when you lesion the HVC? I understand that it means that they are unable to regulate their wing strokes, but does that mean they they just wing stroke to, to any male at any time or are there particular patterns? So we, we, we do not know that. That, that. That's purely hypothetical. It's a model. Right. Um, interestingly, I didn't show you the data that if you look at the response of a female in a box, mm -hmm. you can actually get wing strokes in a box when you present song. So it'd be very interesting to redo our experiments where we lesion HVC and we use our computer vision approaches to look more carefully and see if we can actually change the level of wing stroking in the box. Um, so that's one approach. The other approach we need to do is use our so-called smart aviary and introduce females with um, lesions, replicate the change in male behavior singing to these females and ask whether in fact they are producing more wing strokes. And wing strokes are very hard to see. And if you're just an, um, doing focal sampling in the aviary looking at it, you would never see it. What I can do, <laughs> I can have undergrads spend hours and hours and hours looking at each individual female from eight different camera views and actually try to quantify whether or not they're producing wing strokes. Um, it's an incredibly tedious task, but I think it could be potentially rich in, in, in kind of finding these types of behaviors. So the plan right now is to look at wing stroking behavior in normal context, and then eventually with the introduction of HVC lesion females. And with the unselectivity, do you know that it's just unselective to cowbird songs? I mean, I wonder what would happen if you played other sounds. That's interesting. So we know that in the box, the um, copulation solicitation display, they still will not respond to heterospecific songs. So if you play zebra finch song, I forget what other songs we played. Uh, we played noise, we played zebra finch song, and I think one other song, maybe Sparrow, um, our cowboys never responded to those. That's but a I wonder bit if, you, if you jumbled the song. So, so suppose you did the whistle first and then the other two bits, you know, so you almost reversed it. So yeah. it's still cowbird, but it's not how a cow, male cowbird would normally sing. Right. Sounds like Peter Marlow experiments. I know uh, it yeah, does, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> how I was trained. <laughs> could do that. We certainly, um, we did a few pilot where we just presented the introductory note clusters and mm -hmm. they will go in a posture, normal birds will go in a posture to the introductory note clusters. One of the big questions is what is it about the song that actually uh, that the females are paying attention to? Like what's the difference between a potent song and a less potent song? And, yeah. you know, we could use the UMAP approach, but then you would need a thousand different songs yeah. and know the preference for a thousand different songs, which we cannot do. And so it's, we, we, we could only do that with the numbers and we don't have the numbers. Um, so, so we don't know. Very cool. Kadla, you had a question. Yeah, I mean, it relates to what Mark was just uh, saying, fascinating uh, stuff. 
and uh, thank you, great talk. Thank you. Uh, uh, so if the if they are pair, pair bonded, do you see a preference for the uh, paired male song in the so when you take the female from the aviary into the into the box, uh, do they actually prefer the male songs that they paired with? Uh, and you know, does that overwrite the all other preferences? That, that, that's a really good question. I think that, that's something we're trying to go towards. We've never done this. I don't think anyone has done this. Um, so asking, so it's, so like when you look at, like at, at this assorted of mating, you know, maybe you don't get the, the, the dominant male. So then you have to go for the second male or the third male. And maybe you learn to fall in love with that song. Maybe it's not the most potent song, right. but you fall in love with it. And so if you were to ask that female, between the most the, the song from the dominant male versus her pair bonded mate, maybe she actually prefers from her mate. And, and in that got it, so yeah, and and so if you lesion the HBC, then uh, it will be really interesting to see if if, if there is a preference for the paired uh, male song, and does that also go away or does that persist somehow? Uh, right. And, and right. I know that in song sparrows, for instance, if you take females from the fields and uh, play their own mate song from the field that you recorded uh, compared to a neighbor song or a stranger song, they actually have the high, strongest preference for their own mate song. And the second strongest is neighbor song. And then, you know, the least strongest, uh, uh, the stranger song. This is, this is a, a female CSD responses to song? Song, in, but the, the females are captured from the fields sometime in February and then, you know, kept right. in the lab for a couple of months and then, yeah. But, but you're looking at CSD responses? Yes, CSD response, oh, yeah. Interesting, okay, that, that's, yeah. can, I'm sure I'll send you the yeah, yeah, yeah. I, would love, I would love to take a look this at that. This is Adriana Lachlan's papers. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are there any more questions? I can't see any in the chat. Oh, there is one. Um, I, I can't see who this is from. It says, Dr. Schmidt, thank you for your interesting talk. I'm a psychology PhD student studying developmental dyslexia, humans disorder in learning to read and acoustic rhythms. May I ask, number one, where do you place the microphone to record the zebra finch's vocalization or do you just use the sound signal from the video recording? And then the second one is some researchers, some research suggests that homosexuality exists among zebra finches. How different do homosexual zebra finches sing to their homos homosexual partner candidates? Copulation from yeah, same-sex pairs. Yeah, I hadn't, I, I've certainly not thought about the second question. Um, and I'm not sure how we would define this here. Um, I, can, I can answer the first question easily. The, um, the songs that we have are songs that interestingly are recordings that we had from a long time ago, um, actually from Western King days. Uh, and, and it turns out that all females, even those from Indiana, um, agree on, on, on what the most potent songs are, um, which is interesting, kind of gets to Hala's question or Shala's question. Um, that doesn't mean that, that you cannot start preferring a song that, that of, your, of your pair bonded mate, right? Over those other kind of canonical songs. Um, yeah, so we do not use the audio from the video recordings and in our aviary, our plan is to actually change and put some higher, um, some better microphones um, and some fancy microphones so we can actually um, computationally kind of, uh, um, I don't know what the word is, but um, zoom in on or focus on, oh, it's almost like a, like a, um, like a, what is it called? A, Shall I use those uh, those those uh, parabolic microphones, kind of where you kind of focus in on on the, on the individual uh, singer? So you you can do this computationally, so we can like take our array and kind of focus in on individuals. Um, one of the problems in our aviary is that um, we're in Philadelphia and <laughs> it's very loud, and we it's not beautiful, quiet Cambridge, uh, and there's a trash compaction center about a quarter mile away from our aviary. So there's a lot of low rumbling sound right around the uh, 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 the range where the introductory note clusters are. 
So, so we can't get really good recordings. So we have to try to figure out better ways. But we would love to record, kind of get to Shala's question indirectly, is record song from the aviary if we know the social context. And so we do know that these cowboys can actually change their song. And we suspect that Weston King did this in the 80s um, based on social context and probably also based on hierarchy. So like the more dominant males might actually sing a different song at the end of the season than the lower ranking males. So I'd love to sort of take a song from one male who's kind of average male at the end of the season, he becomes higher ranking male and then ask the female, does she like one more than the other or not? But we would need really high quality recordings from the aviary to do that. So. Very cool. Well, I don't think there are any more questions. So I think it just remains me to ask all of you to thank Mark once again for a wonderful talk. Thank you so mm. much, Mark. We so enjoyed it. And then Shala and Nikki and I will go out for beers in half an hour. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I wish I could join you <laughs> next yeah. time. I'm Mark, so you can sad. grab Errol if you want. Uh, I have to. I'll have to come to Cambridge some other time and visit. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, yes, please. And then we'll, I promise you, I'll buy you a nice beer. Okay. <laughs> and we'll have lots of fun. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thanks Bye. to everyone for attending. Bye. Bye, Mark. Bye, everyone. <laughs>